Habakkuk chapter 3, if you'll stand in honor and re reverence of reading God's Word this morning, just a couple of verses, verse 17 through verse 19 of that third chapter. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength, and he will make my feet like hind's feet. And he will make me to walk upon mine high places to the chief singer on my stringed instruments. Thank you, and be seated. Pray with me again. Father, thank you again for the opportunity, Lord, to do the things we've already done in the way of worship. And Lord, I pray now, Father, I'm so glad that I can stand, Father, Lord, in your presence because of the blood and where it failed. And I'm glad today that I've been covered by the blood. And Lord, I pray, Lord, today that as I stand before these, your people, I pray you'd help me, you'd hide me behind the cross that no flesh your glory. And I pray, Lord, you'd just, uh, through your Holy Spirit, Lord, lead me and guide me and direct me and help me to say what we need to hear and uh, Lord, when it comes invitation time, I pray, dear God, that we listen to the voice of God and respond in the way that we need to. In Jesus' name, amen. When you study this little uh, prophetic book, keep in mind that Habakkuk is positioned between Jeremiah and Daniel, uh, time-wise. So understand that. And we've been studying Jeremiah uh, in Sunday school, and we've been studying Daniel uh, on uh, Sunday nights and Wednesday nights most of the time. But Habakkuk looks ahead, really, to the return of of this 70-year Babylonian captivity that we've seen in both, both books, Jeremiah and Daniel. And I've titled this, When the World Around Us Collapses, because that's literally what was happening as you listen to what Habakkuk writes here as he has this conversation with God. Uh, Habakkuk is patterned much like the book of Job. Uh, we find that they're both a, a dialogue between the prophet and God. In other words, it's a, a question and answer. Uh, the prophet asks ask the question and, and God answers. So the main idea of Habakkuk uh, is the fact that we can praise God for his wisdom. Uh, even when we don't understand all that's going on in our lives, uh, we can praise him for his wisdom. I'll be the first to admit, I don't always understand what God's doing in my life. I don't always understand what God's doing in your life. I don't always understand what God's doing in this community, in this county, in this city. I don't want, understand everything he's doing in this country. But I know he's still on the throne. Amen? Amen. Uh, Habakkuk really presents two main questions and they're found as you begin the book in the first chapter uh, he asked the question literally why are you allowing sin and injustice to prevail in the world in ver the first four verses he says oh Lord how long shall I cry and thou will not hear you ever felt like that like you just keep pray praying and crying out to God and God doesn't seem to hear uh, what you're praying he said even cry out unto thee of violence and thou wilt not save why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous. Therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. He says it seems like there's wrong, wrong, and then there's wrong. It just keeps coming and going. All around me there's violence, there's turmoil, uh, there's so much contention and strife, and it seems like it just doesn't end. Almost like reading our newspaper, isn't it? Almost living the life that you live here uh, in, in the 21st century. And he asks the question, but then he replies to the, and gives the answer in verse 5 through verse 11. He says, listen, I, I want to uh, need to remind you that I'm going to raise up the Chaldeans in verse 6 that, that are that bitter and hasty nation which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. And then he goes on to describe in those verses, 5 through verse 11, uh, the, the judgment that's coming on them uh, through the Chaldeans, or we might refer to the Babylonians. And then he asks also another question in verse 12 through verse 17. And here's the second question he presents us with. He says, how can you use a wicked people to punish your people? Uh, and he gives the answer in chapter 2, verse 2 through verse 20, we see God's reply. Uh, let me just, in a paraphrase, give you chapter 2. He says, listen, I'll stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower, verse 1. I will watch to see what he'll say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. 
And verse 2 says, The Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon the tables that you may run, that he may run that readeth it. So he's presenting a challenge here. Uh, he says here, I, I, there's a message here you need to portray. There's a message you need to deliver uh, because their judgment is coming. And the Lord said, write this answer plainly on tablets, tablets so a runner can uh, run and carry the message uh, of correction uh, to, and to others around you. In verse 3, he says, This vision is for future time. It describes the end. It'll be fulfilled. If it seems slow and coming, wait patiently, for it'll surely take place. It will not be delayed. Now listen to verse 4 and verse 5. He says, Look at the proud. They trust in themselves, and their lives are crooked, but the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. <laughs> Sounds like the day we live in, doesn't it? Verse 5, he says, Wealth is treacherous, and the arrogant are never at rest. They open their mouths as wide as the grave, and like death, they're never satisfied. In their greed, they have uh, gathered up many nations and swallowed up many peoples. Verse 6, But soon their captives will taunt them. They will mock them, saying, What sorrow awaits you, thieves? Now you'll get what you deserve. You become rich by extortion, but how much longer can this go on? I ask myself the same questions. I look across, I look across America. In verse 7, he says, Suddenly your debtors will take action. Uh, they'll turn on you and take all you have while you're, standing, while you're standing trembling and helpless because you've plundered many nations. He says, Now all the survivors will plunder you. You committed murder throughout the countryside and filled the towns with violence. Folks, stop and think for just, Folks are moving from, from some of the major metropolitan areas uh, of our uh, United States of America and they're moving to Abamara and they're moving to small communities because it's so dangerous and it's so treacherous. You can't even run a business without gangs coming in and looting your business. Listen, and taking everything you got and the police are even afraid to arrest them because they're uh, so treacherous. They're because nothing can be done or will be done. He said, What sorrow in verse 9 awaits you there in ch chapter 2, who build big houses with money, gain dishonestly. Uh, you believe your wealth will buy you security, putting your family's nest uh, beyond reach of danger. He said, But by murders you committed, you have shamed your name and forfeited your lives. The very stones in the walls crowd against you, and the beams and the ceilings echo the complaint. What sorrow awaits you who build cities with money gained through murder and corruption? And I could read the rest of it all the way through verse 17. And he finally says in verse 17, he says, listen, judgment's coming. He says, you're going to be cut down. He says, you're going to be cut down. You're going to be, you destroyed the wild animals, uh, so now their terror will be yours. You committed murder throughout the countryside and filled the towns with violence. <laughs> wow. That's the second chapter. He writes the vision. And then he brings forth the pride of the Chaldeans and he speaks of the woe, the violence, and the deceitfulness that's all around him. You know, we don't hear the truth, do we? You see, that's exactly what Habakkuk's doing. Habakkuk, as we begin this book, he says, Oh Lord, how long shall I cry? And thou will not hear. And he says, Listen, Habakkuk, it's not over yet. It's going to get worse. There's some things going to take place. But he reminds them, you see, he, in the first two parts, he presents some questions, and he answers these questions in, in this dialogue. But then he comes back, and he begins to pray in the third chapter. And that's what I want to focus on this morning. There's three things he does. As a matter of fact, uh, verses 3 through verse 16 uh, of that second chapter actually are uh, listed exactly in uh, Exodus chapter 14. Uh, it's, it's not enough to be awed by God's power. Uh, we sometimes need to be disciplined in order to learn to obey Him. And that's what he's saying literally in that second chapter. That's what he's writing on these tablets. Listen, as he runs to and fro and he, and he makes this vision plain. And he wants them to read it and understand that judgment's coming. But in the midst of all that, in the third chapter, he begins to offer a prayer. We see Habakkuk's prayer for God's mercy. God utters to him what's going to take place. Uh, he sees what's going to happen in the future tense. He sees what's going to take place and what's ha been happening. But now he comes to a place and he begins to pray. And, and, and then this prayer for mercy. He says, O Lord, in verse 2, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. He knows that the only hope for, listen, for his nation is revival. 
Can I say today, the only hope for our churches, the only hope for our children, the only hope for our nation today is a revival. It's repentance, ladies and gentlemen. It's turning from the way we're living and turning back to God. He says, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years made known in wrath, remember mercy. And then he goes on to say, and he leads up, and he begins to praise God for God's power in verse 8 through verse 11. And all the way really down through verse 16. But listen to what he says. There's three things that he presents here uh, in this presentation that we want to look at in this praise. Chapter 3 records his prayer for mercy, reminding us there's some things that we can thank God for. Even though we look around us and we see uh, the world collapsing, there's some things in the midst of all that we need to be reminded that we can thank God for. Well, first of all, uh, he says in verse 17, the beginning part of verse 18, uh, we can thank God for His sovereignty, that we can thank God that His sovereignty never changes. For His sovereignty never changes. Think about that for just a moment. He says, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, the very things that made Israel prosperous. You see, they're known for their fertile ground. They're known for their produce. They're known for, the, for having a great production of crops. And he says, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Look what he says in verse 18. He says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. How back it comes to the conclusion. He says, listen, I can thank God because of his, so that his sovereignty never changes. Can I say this morning, do you realize circumstances may change, but God never changes? Circumstances may change, but God never changes. Uh, listen, out of a couple of verses, Malachi 3.6, he, he, he says, I am the Lord, I do not change. This, that is why you descendants of Jacob are not already destroyed. <laughs> Hebrews 13.18 13.8 says, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. James 1.17, Whatsoever is good and perfect comes down from us from God our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shift in shadow. You see, here's the thought. You and I may not be able to rejoice due to our situation, but we can rejoice in our salvation. Don't miss that because it's a key, key statement in this whole message. We might not be able to rejoice in our situation, but we can rejoice in our salvation. That's what he's saying to them. You see, their situation was going to get much more complex. The situation that they were under because of how that forsaken God was going to be much more drastic. And folks, I look around me today, and it, we need to be reminded today as we sit in this church, as we look at the culture in which we live, listen, we can thank God regardless of what happens around us. We can thank Him for His sovereignty never changes. He's got this thing in control. He's God. He's still on the throne. But we have to realize there is a force of evil that's working. There's some things that are happening, and there's some things that must happen uh, to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're on God's prophetic calendar. We cannot escape them. We cannot avoid them. Yes, we, we, we may see a glimmer of hope, and hopefully we do. And hopefully if we, we do see a glimmer of revival. But overall, as you read the Bible, if we believe it, we accept it, we, gotta, we got to respond to it with our hearts and acknowledge it. We can thank God for His sovereignty or that His sovereignty never changes. Secondly, I want you to notice something else Habakkuk says here. Look at verse 18, the second part. He, says, he said, yet, regardless of circumstances, regardless of situations, regardless of the culture, regardless of all the things going on around me, he says, I will rejoice in the Lord. You see, you just got to make up your mind that you're going to rejoice in the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got to make up your mind before you ever get to church. You're going to rejoice this morning. You've got to make up your mind before you ever come to the house of God. Listen, regardless of your circumstances and your conditions and the uh, situations that you're in, you're going to have to rejoice in the Lord. And then look at secondly. He said, I will joy in the God of my salvation. <laughs> we can only thank God because His sovereignty never changes, but we can thank God secondly because His salvation never ceases. 
His salvation never ceases. That's what he's saying in verse 18. There in the latter part, I will joy in the God of my salvation. Can I just stop there for just a moment and say this? When we think about joying in the God of our salvation, let me say two things right here. First of all, I think Habakkuk's coming to a realization that life is uncertain. Life's uncertain. Uh, and we see, as we see the Babylonians moving in, uh, we see the, the, the Chaldeans uh, coming in to uh, take advantage of the children of God, uh, we understand through judgment of God, life is uncertain. You know that? I know that. We ought to know that. James said life is so uncertain. He says it's like a vapor. It appeareth a little while, and then it just vanishes away. It's like a cloud of smoke. Job described life's uncertainty uh, sort of like uh, a, the shuttle on a, 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 of a weaver's shuttle. It's like the, it's so, the revolutions are so fast. Uh, he also described uh, life being like a post or a mail deliverer. Uh, we might refer to that as like the Pony Express. A person would take mail from one place to another. A post in the scriptures. They were known for their thoroughness and their speediness. But life is uncertain here and it seems sometimes just to disappear but I'm glad his salvation never disappears aren't you? it never ceases life's uncertain Habakkuk's coming to realize that but let me just say this we learn from Habakkuk also that life is unfair it's not only uncertain but it's unfair if you've lived long enough listen you, you learn at a very young age to say well that's just not fair we look over here and we say, well, I'm trusting God. I'm living for God. But look at them. They live like a devil. It's just unfair. Well, just let me remind you that God's the one that keeps score, not us and not them. Life's unfair. Well, how, how, how unfair is it, preacher? Listen, 2,000 children will starve to death this year. 6,000 children will be beaten by a mother or father, a parent. Uh, 1,000 children will be raped this year. But life's not fair, is it? No child ought to go through that. No family ought to have to experience that. I picked up this article in preparation for this message. And Gary Bowers, Senior Vice President of Public Policy for uh, Family Focus and James Dobson Ministry, I quote, listen to what he says, A new Fox poll has produced some startling responses to the state of our country. 43% believe our country's best days are ahead of us. The decline in optimism about the future has been dramatic. 48% now believe our country has seen her best days. Since 2012, we've gone from 63% having an optimistic view of our country uh, at, down to 43%. Folks, sometimes we, don't just, uh, we sort of have to wonder about statistics. But just look around you. You can see that those statistics are very inevitable. I go on to read the rest of that article, that quote. The American family is in precipitous decline. Birth rates have plummeted. Newborns are increasingly like, likely to be raised in homes without fathers. Fewer Americans are attending church and reading the Bible than ever in the history of our nation. Corruption is growing in virtually every area of American life. Drug use, alcoholism, and youth suicide are epidemic. Our educational establishment uh, teaches anti-American history. And week after week, we're hearing somebody else that's going woke all around us. But regardless of that, folks, let me remind you, we can thank God for His sovereignty never changes. Habakkuk says we can also thank God for His salvation never ceases. I'm glad regardless of the economy, the environment in which we live, I'm glad God's still on His throne. And then thirdly, we can thank God for His strength never collapses. Look in verse 19. Look what he concludes. Habakkuk says, The Lord is my strength. <laughs> and He will make my feet like hind's feet. And He will make me to walk upon mine high places to the chief singer on my string instruments. Let's get a mindset of what he said here. I thought about that. I thought about God's strength never collapsing. I don't know about this, but it's sort of amazing to me I don't know if you, if you remember just a few weeks ago, that bridge that collapsed on I-95 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And, and in less than two weeks, these folks built, they came in, they brought everything they needed, 
Uh, they, they excavated, they, tore, they got rid of all the demolition, they brought everything they did, and within two weeks, night and day, they have that bridge up and running and traffic going across it. And I thought, something don't make sense here. They've been working on 24-27 for how many years? And they've been building that bridge down there and some other bridges. I, Donald, sorry, brother. Uh, you just designed it, I know. Are you with me? Amen. Uh, but we can thank God. His strength never collapses. Amen. Listen to Psalm 27.1. He said, David said, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my strength and my life. Whom shall I be afraid? I love Isaiah 40, verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Philippians 4.13. Uh, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. We get to that phrase right there in verse 17. He says, the Lord is my strength and he will make my feet like hind's feet. The hind's feet here, he's speaking of that of maybe a goat or like that of an animal, whatever it may be. Uh, but the hind feet are uh, symbols. The hind feet speak of grace. The hind feet speaks of agility. Uh, the hind feet also speaks of swiftness. In other words, it describes sure-footed confidence. Maybe he was talking about those mountain goats there in Israel on different uh, the terrain of the wilderness, whatever the case may be. But he's speaking here of sure-footed confidence. He's reminded us, listen, that we can thank God for his strength never collapses. We can trust him, listen, because he'll make, listen, uh, he will make my feet like hind's feet. He'll give me the grace. He'll give me, he'll give you the agility. He'll give you the swiftness. He'll give you the sure-footed confidence you need when the world around you seem to be collapsing. Praise the Lord. Amen. And I don't know about you, but every now and then, I feel like my world's collapsing as I look around. Everything that we've preached and fought against and stood for as a church of the Lord Jesus Christ just keeps seem, seems to escalate. But let me just say this. God enables us to rise. God, the idea here in verse 19 is this. God enables you and I to rise above, above the circumstances around us. And thank God He does. Through His grace, through the agility and the swiftness He gives us and the sure-footed confidence. As I come to conclusion this morning, as I look just in, in, the, in the nutshell in these three chapters, how powerful they are, Habakkuk learned that God is our salvation and He's our song. He says that in verse 19. He says, To the chief singer on my string instruments, Habakkuk learned. Now listen, that God is our salvation and our song when the world around us seems to be collapsing. Let me challenge you this morning to take your eye off, your, off the difficulties around you and look to God. That's what Habakkuk was doing. He was looking at the difficulties and he began to ask questions. He said, Lord, why is this happening? Lord, what's the purpose of this? He asked those questions as he opened, this, opened the book in the first chapter. He says, why are you allowing sin and injustice to prevail in the world? It has to, and it will. It doesn't excuse us from confronting it and standing against it, but it's going to take place. It's a part of our fallen creation. How can you use the wicked people to punish your people? God has. What scares me is he might do it again if we're not careful. He says, take your eyes off the difficulties around you and look to God. Some of us walked in here this morning. We've got difficulties in our lives. We've focused on that so much. You see, if when you focus on that so much, it'll rob you of your worship. It'll rob you of your praise. It, it, there's so much bombarding us today. and There's so much to drag us down. Uh, listen, at the school, at, at work, and everywhere we go, it just seems like it's so prevalent. And it'll drag you down. That's why you need to be in the house of God more than you've ever been. That's why he said in the book of Hebrews not to forsake uh, the assembly of yourselves together and so much more as you see the day approaching. Because we, as we do a parallel between Jeremiah and Habakkuk, uh, Habakkuk and Daniel and all the Old Testament prophets, we see a resurfacing, uh, listen, of all the things that they preached against and the things that they spoke out against. Listen, they're recirculating. And they're becoming more of a force than they've ever been. 
And then the second thing we need to be reminded of is this. We can't see all that God's doing or that he will do, but you just need to be assured that there's nothing that's kept him, caught him off guard. You just need to be assured he's still on the throne. He knows where we're at. And by the way, sometimes he'll give us what we want. may not be what he wants, but he'll give us what we want. The only thing about it is we have to reap the repercussions for what we've asked for and what we've accepted and what we've adopted and what we've turned to to turn away from him. I'm going to ask us to stand this morning for our hymn of invitation. Mr. Joyce, if you'll come and play. Honestly, as our heads bowed, eyes closed, you would have to agree with me 100% that the world around us in a lot of ways is collapsing. It's evident, it's apparent, and it's very easy to get discouraged when we ask why, why, why. But folks, we need to be reminded of these three tr tr truths that he showed Habakkuk and he shows us. Maybe you're here this morning, you never accepted Jesus Christ. Listen, your time is running out to get your heart right with God. I believe that because I stand here. I don't know when time's up for you. It may be even before the Lord does come back to this earth. It may be before the Lord calls the church home. I don't know. You don't know either. But I do know that life moves pretty swift. Are you going through life without a relationship with Jesus Christ? If you were to die this morning, where would you spend eternity? Why wouldn't you trust Christ this morning as your Savior? Secondly, if you're here this morning and you profess to know Christ, you're trying to serve the Lord. It seems like you take two steps forward and three back. It seems like every time you start going forward, there's some obstacle, something in the way, something in the way trying to crush and collapse your Christian testimony and witness. Maybe you just need to come this morning and ask him for grace. Maybe you need to come this morning and say, Lord, I just want to thank you that your sovereignty never changes. Lord, I want to thank you that your salvation never ceases. I want to thank you that your strength never collapses. Maybe he's just brought you through a valley or a battle and you just need to come and praise him. Or maybe you're in the midst of a difficulty right now and it seems like you don't know which way to turn, why wouldn't you fall on your knees this morning before a holy God and say, Lord, I just want to thank you for your salvation. Lord, I want to ask you for strength. I want to ask you for the strength and the confidence that I need to get back in the fight again and stand for what's right. My faith has collapsed. My witness has collapsed. My courage has collapsed. And I need your grace and your mercy to restructure and rebuild my heart and my life so that I'll be that vibrant Christian that I used to be. Father, thank you for your word of encouragement to us through the book of Habakkuk. Lord, I realize all around us there's confusion, there's chaos. Lord, we live in a, in a very difficult day. We can't hide that fact. But, Lord, we are reminded that we can find strength, we can find courage, and we can find boldness in you this morning if we'll just be obedient. Lord, I realize more than ever, we, just, we need you to revive us. We need you to help us and encourage us today individually and collectively. Lord, I pray this morning during this invitation that we'd respond in the way and the fashion and the manner that you would speak to us to about today. I pray for that person that's discouraged and defeated and don't know which way to turn. Feels like the props have been kicked out from under them. And they're asking you why this and why that. Lord, help them get their eyes back on you and serve you in the capacity they ought to be serving you. In Jesus' name, amen. Their heads bowed and eyes closed.